I am, if you know me at all, uh, or if you've been in my office and looked at my bookshelf, you'll know uh, that your pastor is an avid, and I don't want to hear any booze when I say this either, uh, your pastor is an avid North Carolina basketball fan. Uh, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of great basketball uh, in my 30th, put that down. I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of uh, good, great basketball uh, in my 33 years of being a North Carolina basketball fan. I started when I was about 10. I'm not 33. I am 43. But I started when I was about 10. And I've seen some bad basketball. Uh, back in 2001, uh, UNC brought in Matt Doherty as the head coach of the University of North Carolina. And he had only been a head coach for about a year uh, at Notre Dame. Now, but because he was part of the family, uh, he played for Dean Smith. He coached for Roy Williams, who was a disciple of Dean Smith. And he says, Matt, come on in and, and lead our program. Well, it quite frankly ended up being a disaster. Uh, the players behind the scenes hated him, uh, was threatening to transfer. Uh, he was a tough taskmaster behind the scenes. He was rude and hateful to even the staff, the secretaries. Uh, and on the court is even worse. Guys running around not knowing their roles, doing things they shouldn't have been doing on the court, so to speak. And after three years, Matt Doherty was fired as the head coach of the University of North Carolina. So North Carolina went to Kansas and essentially probably got down on their hands and knees and begged Roy Williams to come back and clean up the program. Roy Williams was a disciple of Dean Smith and, and, and uh, coached with Dean Smith, and so Roy came back. The problem was they had a lot of talent, but they didn't know how to put the talent together. They had five McDonald's All-Americans. To some of you, that means nothing, but it means they had some pretty good talent out on the floor. And, but they all had to buy in and know their role and know where they fit. One of those players was a shooting guard by the name of Jackie Manuel. Now, shoot, say, what's a shooting guard? I know nothing about basketball. A shooting guard comes up the court, and the point guard passes him the ball, and he's supposed to shoot. There was one problem with Jackie Manuel. He couldn't shoot. So how do you have a shooting guard that can't shoot? Thank you, Will. So... Matt Doherty's last year, Jackie shot 29% from behind the three-point line. That's bad. So Coach Roy brought in Jackie. And this, I'm not making this up. This actually happened. And says, Jackie, we love to have you on the team, but there's one condition. You can't shoot ever unless you're wide open underneath the basket. And it's a dunk or a layup. You can't shoot anymore, Jackie, because you're good at playing defense and getting some rebounds. This is your lane. Now, Jackie, if you want to stay, this is, this is what you're going to have to do. But if you want to leave and transfer, I'll help you leave and, tra and find you another school to where you can shoot, but shoot poorly. So Jackie says, I'll stay. And Jackie stopped shooting. He didn't shoot. He passed, he rebounded, and he defended and Roy got Sean May to lose weight. Taught Raymond Felton how to pass the ball. Everybody got to know their roles. And in two years, they became national champions. Jackie bought in, became a part of the team. He became, catch this, a part of the body that became a national champion. Did you catch that last word? I used that word on purpose. Jackie became a part of the body. Did you know that you're a part of, the, of a body? You, Ted, and you, Jeffrey, and you, Kenny, you're a part of a body. If you are a born-again Christian, then you're a part of the body of Christ. You're a part of the, the church universal, if you will. But this church, this, this body is described in 1 Corinthians 12 as a living, breathing organism. It is a spiritual body of Christ of which he is the head and we are his hands and his feet. And the, this is an exclusive club. Not just anybody can be a part of this club. Hey, I want to sign up. No, you have to be baptized in by the Spirit of God into this body. And you do that by repenting of your sins and placing faith and trust in his finished work. 
The good news is, is that this church, this body is indestructible. Jesus says that the gates of hell itself cannot prevail against this body. And how do you demonstrate that you're a part of this church universal? I believe you demonstrate it by being a part of a local body like this one. Every member of Christ's church has been given these supernatural gifts. And we here at Barbie's Grove Baptist Church, each and every one of us in the church, and I've said this once, but it fits here, this building is just that. It's a building. Barbage Grove Baptist Church could meet across the road in the field. Barbage Grove Baptist Church could meet in the parking lot. All too often we say, well, let's meet up at the church. That's not technically true. Let's meet up at the building where the church meets. And each one of us that make up Barbage Grove Baptist Church that are saved, born again, have been endowed with spiritual gifts. And they are the means through which believers are to grow, worship, witness, and serve. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then hold your place there. Put your bulletin there. Once you get to 1 Corinthians 12, and turn to Romans 12. We're going to read quite a bit of passage of Scripture this morning, but these passages fit uh, this idea of spiritual gifts. And I'm, I am not going to do service to either one of these passages or do justice. Uh, I've seen pastors go for eight or nine months just on these two passages of Scripture. So we're just going to, we're going to water, ski, water ski across the top this morning. But Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Now take it and hold your place there and turn to 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking of the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but there is the same God who empowers them in all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit of Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, by the same Spirit. Uh, to another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body through many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks. Slaves were free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. For the body does not consist of one member but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would, make, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. 
If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? Where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again to the head, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honor, honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping administration, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do we possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a more excellent way. Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts this morning. Number one, I want you to notice the source of your gifts. The source of your gifts. And we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. Beginning in verse 7. A spiritual gift is given. Verse 11 carries with it the same idea. It says, all, the, all these are empowered by one and the same spirit. Romans 12, 6, in his grace, God has given us. Here's the thing. We didn't, when we get saved, we didn't go to the assembly line or go to my office and go, you know, I think I want that gift. Or I'll take this gift and I'll work it up or I'll make it happen. No, God in his supernatural wisdom gives you one or more spiritual gifts. See, God has given you something very special. The ability you have, the gift you have, it did not come from you. You can never say God's never given you anything. If you're a believer this morning, if you've trusted Christ this morning, God has given you something very precious, very honorable. He's bestowed it upon you. And what that should work in our lives is humility. Because we didn't do anything to get it. He just gives it liberally. In Romans chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, it says, because of the privilege and authority God's given me, I give each of you this warning. Before he talks about spiritual gifts, he gives this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Well, I have this special gift. And my gift is better than your gift. And if we have the same gift, I exercise my gift better than you exercise your gift. Paul says, no, 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 no. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. See, we, this idea that God is the source of our spiritual gift, it brings humility because everybody's got their own different gift. Everybody's working at a, at a different pace. You've got your gift, I've got my gift. But we both get it from the same source, and that is God through the Holy Spirit. How many times have you looked at someone and go, well, we should exercise your gift, or, or I'm better than you because my gift is higher than yours, or more noticeable than yours. No, Paul here is trying, before he talks about spiritual gifts, bring us in line and go, no, this idea that God has given us this gift should work humility in us. I, we're no better than each other. Humility, the source is God. Number two, the uniqueness of your gift. The uniqueness of your gift. I don't even know if uniqueness is a word, but it fits. Yeah, I know you've heard this phrase that everybody is different. Everybody's different. We see it in our children, don't we? 
Madison is different than Noah. Brady is different than Madison. Judson is different than Melanie. Amen, Leah. We're all different. Not just in our personalities, but in how God has gifted us. Romans chapter 12, again, verse 6. In his grace, God has given us different gifts. Different. What's your gift might not be my gift. What's my gift might not be your gift. We really see this back in 1 Corinthians. Again, you can look there. You don't have to, but you can look there. Verses 13 and 14, Paul uses the idea here. Again, talking about the body. Hey, some are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. But we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. We're all different. We're all different. And in verses 14 through 27, Paul uses this body analogy. And I won't reread this, but you saw the, the eye, the feet, the hand. Everybody's got a role to play, a function to feel. And here's the thing. Everybody's important. See, the church in Corinth, this church in Corinth was not a good church. It was riddled with issues and problems. And one of the problems was it was chaos, number one. But another one was everybody wanted the big showy gifts. Like everybody wanted to speak in tongues. Everybody wanted to preach. They all wanted the showy gifts. And nobody wanted the less, well, in their minds, the less important gifts. Like, well, I don't want that gift. I, I want to I wanna be up front. I want to be on the stage. I want people to see me. Paul says, no, 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 look. Everybody's got a part to play. You're unique in that sense. That you're important. And look, if, if, if Grant and Aaron weren't serving in the nursery, we might know it. They're, what they're doing is as valuable as what I'm doing. It's all valuable. We're all unique. Now, I've used that term more than once, and, and it's kind of used in, in, in Christendom uh, kind of to make you feel special, to make you feel important. And, and that's not why I want to use it today. You've heard that term where you're, you're unique, you're God's masterpiece, but you're unique not for your sake. You're unique for somebody else's sake. You see, all of us have a lane to run in when it relates to our spiritual gift. Right? We all have a lane. And we see this in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31. He says, all of you together are Christ's body. And then we see the, the, the unity of it all. And each one of you has a part. There are some that God's given apostles and some are prophets and, and some are teachers and those who have this gift and some help others and, and those the gift of leadership and those who speak in unknown languages. Paul says, are, are we all apostles? Are we are we all prophets? Do we all have this power? Do we all have the gift of healing at the end? Of course not. Not everybody has the same gift. We found this out at the end of Vacation Bible School. And this isn't an apples to apples illustration. But it fits, I think. Jeff had to take a little time off from serving. He wasn't feeling well. And we needed somebody to cook and get here and, and turn the grill on. That's not my talent. That's not my lane. You don't want me turning the grill on. You don't want me cooking the grill. But I, <laughs> I was not wanting an amen there. But it's true. It's true. So what, what happened is is I think I've got a little bit of a gift of service where I want to serve. So you know what I did? I got in somebody else's lane and I served. I served. It needed to be done. Not exactly my lane, but I got in it because it needed to be done. I served. And, and people were kind of mocking me, joking a little bit. and uh, the, 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 the grill went out and 
oh heavens, Jeff had somebody come start the grill and then the grill went out because the lid dropped and man, what are we going to do? And I'm calling Jeffrey, Jeffrey, get down here and light this grill. And Leah's like, why you got to go down there? Jeffrey's like, because Philip don't know what he's doing. <laughs> and Jeffrey got down here and lit the grill. And I made this comparison in this fence. Look, me trying to cook and serve in that way is like getting Jeff down here to preach for me. <laughs> Jeff's going to be out of his lane speaking and teaching. I was out of my lane cooking, if you will. But we've all got a, we've all got a lane to run in. So we've got the source of our gifts, the uniqueness of our gifts, and then the purpose of our gifts. It's very simple. God has given you your gifts so that everyone else will be blessed, edified, encouraged, fill in the blank. It's all about others as it relates to your gift. It's never about you ever. First Corinthians 14, 12. And the same is true for you since you are so eager to have the special abilities the Spirit gives. Seek those that strengthen the whole church. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. We'll go back there. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Your spiritual gift is not for you. It's for somebody else. Romans 12, 4 and 5. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. I don't belong to me and you don't belong to you. We belong to each other, impacting each other with our gifts. 1 Corinthians 10, 4. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. The point is simply this, is simply this that each member functions to serve the body. Let me say that again. Each member functions to serve the body. We don't come to church for ourselves. We don't come to church looking to make sure we get served. We come to church seeing how we can serve or minister our gift to other people. Verse 7 back in 1 Corinthians says, all of us that help each other, that Greek phrase there uh, is rendered pretty clearly here in the NLT, but it means to, to, have, to help, to confer, to, to be beneficial, to be advantageous, if I can use that big word. Spiritual gifts would be edifying and helpful to the church. And not only does it help other people, it, it helps the one giving it. You become more encouraged when you see people exercising their gifts. The, the pastor who faithfully uses his gift to preach and to teach not only builds them up, but as he uses his gift, it helps them use their gift. On the other hand, when we fail to minister our gifts, we hurt other people. We're cheating them. We're shortchanging them. A Christian who does not exercise his gifts cripples his own ministry and the ministry of others. You know, when we exercise our gifts, when we're functioning the way God tells us to function, use our spiritual gifts, it's a blessing. The church has great unity and togetherness and oneness because everybody's working and, and using their gifts and going in the same direction. It's real easy, especially in, in my background, when someone misses church or, or they become unfaithful just to, to kind of to, to beat them over the head with the Bible and say, bless God, get back in church and uh, bless God, get right with God and, and all of those things. And I was talking with someone one time about their faithfulness to the house of God, to church, and, and I took this approach with it. I looked at them and I smiled. And I said, you know what? You're cheating me. 
You're cheating me. And you're cheating yourself. Had that quizzical look at me. What do you mean? Well, you, I said, you've got a gift. You've got a spiritual gift that you are to be using and ministering. And, and you're not doing that. And in essence, by you not doing that, you're cheating me. You're stunting my growth. And your growth is stunted because you're not coming. Because you're not getting the full impact of everybody else's gifts. You got the source of the gift, the uniqueness of the gifts, and the purpose of the gifts. Finally, you got the stewardship of our gifts. This kind of bleeds over from the third point about the purpose of our gifts. But we use the term stewardship. It's a big fancy word, isn't it? We've got a stewardship committee here. And stewardship is simply a word that means that you manage something. It's how you care for something. It's what you do with something. And when we say the word stewardship, the first thing that pops into our mind is what? Money. <laughs> stewardship committee, money. 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 Now, it's like money. And when we talk about our gifts, when you're not stewarding them well, you'll never use them well. It's like money. It's like, have you ever heard of these churches that they walk around and say, well, we've got $400,000 in the bank. Or, well, we've got $350,000 in the bank. Or maybe some of you have some money stuck away. And, boy, you've got it stuck away. I'll gently, sweetly tell any church and you, you're not stewarding your money very well. Because God's given it to you to use it. God has given you this gift to use it. He's given you this spiritual gift, not to keep it to yourself, but to use it, to be a good steward of it. Notice verses 6 through 9 in Romans 12. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy or to preach, speak. You've got this ability to preach, you better preach, he says. Verse 7, if your gift is serving others, you better serve. You better serve. Verse 8, if your gift is to encourage, be encouraging. If, it's, if you have the gift of giving, you better give. Those of you, if you have a leadership, you better take it seriously and do it. See, God never gives anybody an out. Like I've given you this gift and now it's kind of up to you to use it. No, no, no. He says, you better use it. You better use it. Why? Because you're cheating yourself and you're cheating other people. You're shortchanging people. Can I ask you a question this morning? How are you stewarding your gift? this gift that God gave you at the moment of your salvation? Are you keeping it to yourself because of whatever? I mean, whatever excuse you've, you've conjured up in your mind, well, I'm not going to do such and such because, see, we all got a gift. Maybe, maybe you are using it, but you're just using it in the wrong place. Well, I use my spiritual gift at my work. Well, that's not a negative. That's just not the place you're to use it. Because you're to edify the body of Christ. Maybe you've seen all these things. You've seen who's, who's given it to you, that every gift is unique, that the purpose of it is to, to bless others and that you got to use it. But maybe you're in this quandary this morning. I'm not even sure what my gift is. I don't even know. I want to, but I'm just kind of, uh. We've been in Romans chapter 12, but I own purpose excluded the first two verses. We're going to go back to Romans 12, the first two verses. And these verses are not unfamiliar. But again, the thing about Bible interpretation is the context 
Romans 1, 12, 1 and 2 are given in the context of this passage of spiritual gifts. So look what verse 1 says. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Notice this. Then you will learn to know God's will for you. And then he talks about spiritual gifts. You don't know what God's will is for you? Give your bodies to God. Draw nigh to him. Give yourself wholly to him and God transforms you. Then you will know by your desires what you desire to do because he will transform your desires. Then you'll know. There's a passage that is so often taken out of context and ripped and, and handled the wrong way and I don't have it on the board, but write it down, Psalm 37, 4. You may have heard this verse before. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Pastor, does that mean if I delight in the Lord, I'll get that brand new Porsche or that, that brand new motorcycle or I'll, I'll get that swimming pool? No, that's not what it means. What it means is that you delight. You, this ties with this passage. You delight in God. You give yourself to God and God will transform you and your desires and then he'll take those desires and he'll give them to you. If you're walking with the Lord and you've given your body to him, I would wholeheartedly tell you, do what your heart desires. Don't worry about taking a spiritual gift test, walk with the Lord, give yourself to the Lord and follow that desire that's in your heart. And then you'll be walking and running in your lane. Why spiritual gifts today? Why aren't we back in John today? This is the reason. Next week, we're going to be voting on the Barbies Grove Baptist Church 2015-16 church year officers and ministry leaders. And we've got some open spots just for you. How can you use your gifts to serve the body? How can you use your gifts to serve the body? It's that simple. God's given it to you. It's unique. It's different. You're, you are to use it for other people's benefit. So we're going we're gonna to have an invitation, but as you leave today, these will be down front. We've got enough, one per family, to get one. Look at it. How can I use my gifts to benefit the body? Because I've got a gift. God tells me to use it. I want to use it. This is your opportunity to use your spiritual gift. Every head bowed, every eye closed as our musicians come. I just, I just gently and sweetly ask you, what excuse have you given? What excuse have you given? Not to use your gift. Well, I've done that in the past. I'm not going to do it now. I'm too busy. Maybe you know what your gift is and you're just not using it. 
You're not using it. And maybe you don't know what your gift is and you haven't been walking with the Lord. You're just kind of drifted away and you haven't given your body to him. I'm telling you, today's a great day, believer, to give yourself wholly to him and let him transform your desires. Maybe you're here today and you're not a believer. You don't have a spiritual gift. But if you come today and receive Christ, if you repent of your sin, turn from your way and place your faith and trust in him, he will give you a gift here today. Eternal life. <laughs> Eternal life. That is the greatest gift. So someone here today say, I've, I've got a gift. I, I've used it in the past and maybe I've stopped using it. And God's just kind of done a work on me today. You just slip my hand up, say, that's, that's me. I haven't used my gift like I need to. I want to serve. Maybe you haven't been walking with the Lord and you want to walk closer with the Lord, giving your heart and mind to him. Whatever your need is today, I want to let you know God can meet that need. Let God do a work in your heart today. Father, we thank you for today and Lord, your word and uh, this idea of giftedness. Father, we thank, thank you for those today that have served that's taught, that's worked in the nursery, that's, Lord, counted. Father, for the giftedness we've seen operated here today. Father, I pray that you would move on hearts and lives to fill these roles, that you would work on hearts right now, that we wouldn't have any empty spots next week as we come to vote. Father, that this body would be healthy and functioning, everyone operating inside their giftedness. Father, we'll give you the glory for what you'll do in the, in the hearts and lives of your people. In Christ's name I pray, amen.